Good morning, everyone. My name is Lana Marie Musa, and I'm one of the vice presidents of Peace. I am very happy to introduce our first speaker, Donna Harati. I had the privilege of meeting her when I took a trip to California this past November, and she was kind enough to accept my offer to lunch, and we had a fabulous two hours, and I absolutely loved everything she had to say. Um, and she's wonderful to talk to, so I'm very happy that we all get to hear her talk today. So Donna is the Director of Legal Services and Community Lawyer at Homeboy Industries, which is sanctioned in California. She works to mitigate the harms of the legal service of the legal system on both individual and systematic levels. Donna taught for two years full-time at the Penitentiary of New Mexico while simultaneously serving at a hotline crisis volunteer with the local Rape Crisis Center. She graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School and summa cum laude from Georgetown University. In law school, she was involved in anti-displacement, mediation, and prison abolition work. She has been doing prison-related work for 12 years, and today Donna will be discussing abolition and transformative justice. So please welcome Donna Harati. Um, okay, hello, good morning. Thank you so much for the really kind introduction, Lana. It was a privilege to have lunch with you. And I'm really so honored um, to have been asked back here. I was on the prison education panel in 2016 um, and was connected to peace because when I was teaching at the penitentiary of New Mexico, my boss, the great Michelle Ribeiro, who was the keynote three years ago um, in conjunction with Dr. Wells, started a program called the Pen Project. Um, and I was able to be a part of that program when I was teaching at PNM. And so thank you so much to Lana and to Winter and to Dr. Wells, who have shared a lot of emails over the last few months, and to everyone else who um, has made it possible for us to be here. And I feel especially, especially honored and privileged to be speaking here today alongside two of my dear friends, um, my colleague Gabriel Lopez, who I work with at Homeboy Industries, and my dear, dear friend Tyra Patterson, um, to be able to share a stage with them is really the greatest honor and you're in for a real treat when you hear their brilliance and experience and insights and wisdom and I just apologize that you have to listen to me first. Um, so that's really the highlight of this conference. We'll be hearing from them. But I, what I want to offer um, and present on today is a different framework for thinking about prison education work, a broader framework um, in how we go about this work. So my goals for this presentation are first to introduce the idea of prison abolition and then to um, talk about transformative justice and how transformative justice can be one framework tool in getting us to a place of abolition. And then finally, to leave everyone with a concrete tool for how we can go about trying to embody and implement transformative justice in our daily lives. And that's the pod mapping worksheet that we'll end with. And those are on your tables, but we don't need them right now. OK. Um, so this is a picture of the penitentiary of New Mexico that I taught at outside Santa Fe for two years. And this is a picture from 1980 when the facility was the site of one of the deadliest riots um, uprisings in American history. And I, uh, I believe over 70 incarcerated individuals died and all, over 130 were injured. And um, it's widely agreed upon that the causes of the uprising were poor conditions in the facility. So it was extremely overcrowded. There were beds for 900 folks, but they had 1,200 folks incarcerated there. Um, there was inadequate access to medical care. There was inadequate food. And then it was very understaffed given um, how overcrowded and overpopulated it was. So. Again, that's just to give you a little bit of context in what my um, relationship to prisons has been. So the prison that I spent the most time in, that I spent 40 hours a week for two years in, had a very, very overt history of violence. Um, but I think what has been most influential for me personally is how 
working in that facility daily. And I want to be very clear that I would never, ever, ever compare my experience just teaching in a prison to the experience of actually being incarcerated. It, it has no comparison. And at the same time, just spending 40 hours a week and still being able to go home at night has had really lasting effects on my well-being and my psyche that um, I'm still trying to work through and that I'm still trying to heal from. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from, is that I think, for me personally, this institution um, really succeeded in um, breaking parts of me, and I think that they're designed to do that. So before I get into a little bit more of the theoretical framework around abolition, I wanted to pose a question to everyone, and this is a question that my friend Kim Wilson, who's an amazing abolitionist and posts a really, really engaging podcast called the Beyond Prisons podcast, which I highly recommend to everyone. It's free to download on any podcast platform, and um, Kim in addition to being an amazing activist and scholar, is a mother to two sons who are serving life sentences. Um, so I saw her give a talk on prison abolition, and she started by posing a question to the audience, which is, what do you need to feel safe? And if we had more time, we'd do it as a little exercise in groups. But for now, if you just want to take 10 to 15 seconds to kind of think about when you think of safety, um, what is it that you need to feel safe in your life? What comes up? And if you want to jot down some notes, you can go ahead and do that, or if you just want to think about it. But I'll just stay quiet for a few seconds. OK, so whatever your answer was, I just want us all to kind of hold that in the back of our heads as we go forward with the rest of this um, presentation and to kind of think about what was included and what was excluded in your definition of safety and how does that relate to um, what are some of the purported functions of prisons and what actually goes on in prisons and the role that they've come to play in our society. How does that tie in to what you personally need in order to feel safe? Okay, so I, because this is a prison education conference, I do want to be clear that even though I'm talking about abolition, I think that there's a lot of value to prison education. I've been involved in prison education work since I was 18 years old. In college, I was in a group very similar to Peace called Prison Outreach that was extremely transformative and influential to me. Um, and I think that given that we do have these sites of incarceration, education can be a really important harm reduction tool and practice. And if it's done in the right, ba right way, it can be a liberatory practice. And for those of us who are on the outside, who are going in as educators, I, th I think a lot about um, what my boss, Father Greg, who Gabriel will talk a lot more about our work at Homeboy Industries, but um, Father Greg at Homeboy Industries says a lot that part of our work at Homeboy is to stand at the margins until the margins are erased. And I think going into prisons, doing this kind of prison education work, bearing witness in that way, can play a huge role in doing that work of erasing the margins. So I don't want to discount prison education work at all. I want to be clear about that. I think it's really, really important. And at the same time, I don't think that um, it gets to the root of what our structural issues are in terms of the fact that we're putting people in cages. And one statistic that I saw that um, was kind of surprising to me that I wanted to share that to the limits of prison education, because I think a lot of people will, um, a lot of reformists will point to prison as if we just had more education programs in prison, then it would be okay. Then we'd be rehabilitating everyone and it would be fine. But I think it's really important to talk about the limits of it. So formerly incarcerated folks who earned a GED in prison compared to folks who earned a GED outside of prison. Less than 1% of those who earned a GED in prison end up graduating college, whereas close to 5% of those who earned a GED outside of prison end up graduating college. 
in terms of attending some college, less than 10% of those who earned the GED in prison attend college, whereas almost 43% of those who earn a GED outside prison end up attending college. And we can, there, you know, we can speculate as to why those differences are, but I think all of us who have done this kind of prison education work know that prisons are not designed to be institutions of learning. <laughs> there are a lot of barriers to doing education work in prison, and when folks come out of prison, there are a lot of barriers that they're facing that can make it difficult to pursue a higher education. And Gabriel will talk a lot about the work we do at Homeboy Industries to try to mitigate those barriers, and um, he's an example of someone who has overcome those barriers, and Tyra will talk about all of the degrees that she got when she was incarcerated. So of course it's possible, but I think on a structural level, um, it, it's important to recognize all of the real material barriers that folks are facing as a result of the conditions within the prison and as a result of all the barriers that we impose on folks who come out. Okay, and so I'm not going to go too much into the history of prisons. There's a lot of great books and resources about that, but one thing that I did want to point out is that the first prisons in the United States were um, founded after the American Revolution, and they were based off of um, English workhouses, and those workhouses were explicitly designed to cure, quote, the idleness of the poor. So again, I think it's important to recognize that these institutions from their founding, from the very first instances, have been imbued with biases and with um, certain perceptions about folks who have been on the margins from the beginning. And then the second little historical anecdote I wanna give is that um, it was actually Quakers who came up with solitary confinement. And that's not usually the association that we would make because Quakers today are big prison activists. They've always been peace loving. They've always had the best of intentions and they had really good intentions with solitary confinement. Their intention and their thinking was that if someone is isolated, if someone is alone, it gives them more space and time to think and to pray and to repent and to be able to reflect on what they did. Now, of course, today we know that solitary confinement has all kinds of negative implications and effects on the mental, physical, psychological health of people that it can really alter even adults' brain chemistry, and the United Nations considers it to be torture. So. The Quakers didn't know that. They didn't have any malicious intent. They only had positive intent, but I think it's an example of how even the most well-intentioned reforms when it comes to prison can end up being harmful and why we need to move past a reformist mindset when we're thinking about these institutions and be honest about the fact that um, the only thing that, the only moral answer really is to move towards um, ending these institutions completely. Okay, so why do we even have prisons? What are some of the commonly cited purposes of prisons? So traditionally there are four purposes of prisons that, um, four justifications that are cited. The retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, and incapacitation. So the first retribution is basically punishment. So when someone causes harm, um, we want there to be some kind of retribution. We want there to be some kind of just punishment in response. And that sounds good in theory, but thinking about um, how crime is defined in our society, it's, I think we have to acknowledge that that crime is not a stable category and it's something that has shifted and changed with time. So for example, marijuana in California is now legal. In many parts of the country, it's still not legal. There are a lot of people who are still serving very serious sentences, including life sentences for marijuana related crimes. So just how we categorize crime um, is, not, is, is not static. Second of all, who gets charged with crime um, it, there's a lot of discretion in terms of, um, first of all, who gets arrested, and we know that discriminatory stops, practices like stop and frisk, affect people of color disproportionately, affect poor people disproportionately, so who is brought into the net of incarceration is, um, is racialized and um, is 
based on class in a lot of ways. Like we all know that in college campuses, on ASU's campus, for example, there's probably all kinds of illicit drug activity. Those folks are not being stopped and frisked regularly by the police. That's very different from youth who grew up grow up in Boyle Heights, the neighborhood that Homeboy, Homeboy Industries came from, um, who don't have a dorm room to be able to you know, smoke weed in in private and have been regularly stopped by the police and end up in the system from a young age. Um, and then the, the last component I'll talk about with retribution is that you're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers. Um, juries very rarely represent the folks who are being accused of crime. So first of all, if you have a criminal conviction, you can't serve on a jury. If you don't speak English, you can't serve on a jury. If you can't read, you can't serve on a jury. And that's not that's not even touching the fact that it's so easy for there to be um, dis discriminatory, um, to, to kick people off, for attorneys to kick people off of juries um, based on pretextual reasons when it's really because of their race. So there's a lot of Supreme Court cases that try to address this issue, but it's still very common and very rampant for there to be all white juries when the person being accused of the crime is a person of color. So when we're thinking of what just punishment is, I just want us to think about all these inequities that are baked into different layers of the system that end up influencing who actually ends up in prison and who doesn't. Um, the second commonly given reason is deterrence. So that's the idea that if you see that someone is going is being punished and going to prison for a crime, you're less likely to commit that crime. Or you went to prison for a crime, so then you're less likely to do it. The recidivism rate in the United States is 67%. So I think that in and of itself is a huge argument against deterrence and the fact that prisons don't work as a deterrent. There's also a lot of other research um, that goes more in depth into deterrence as a concept and shows that it's not effective. Um, the third commonly cited purpose of prison is rehabilitation. So that's that it's a space and opportunity for people to be able to rehabilitate themselves and um, come out you know, improved and better. I think anyone who has spent time in prisons, any of you who have worked in prison as educators know that the rehabilitative programs, the education programs, the treatment programs are a very, very, very small part of the budget and are almost always the first thing to go. I mean, um, the Penn Project, which was a free program that was being run by volunteers at the penitentiary of New Mexico, was cut year after year. Um, so it just goes to show that it is more an ideological priority and that rehabilitative programs are rarely the priority in corrections um, departments. And again, the recidivism rate I think shows that our prisons, even if, even if their purpose was rehabilitation, are failing when it comes to that. And then the last um, purpose of prisons that's often cited is incapacitation. So incapacitation is the idea that you cause harm and the way to deal with that harm is to take you out of the community so that you can't cause harm anymore. So 97% of people who are incarcerated end up returning to the community. So there are, of course, the death penalty is still practiced in the United States and there are life without possibility of parole sentences, so those folks are in, in essence, permanently physically incapacitated, but for the majority of folks who are incarcerated, they're not physically permanently incapacitated. They're incapacitated for a short period of time, but I would argue that when they are released from incarceration, there's still an inca incapacitation imposed in terms of their ability to fully participate in civil society. In the, in the way that a criminal conviction has come to kind of represent a scarlet letter in our society. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, um, it, it, like I mentioned before, you can't serve on a jury if you have a conviction. In a lot of states, your voting rights are still um, severely restricted if you have a conviction. And in almost every state, it's legal to be discriminated against in terms of housing and jobs if you have a criminal conviction. Um, and that's not to mention no longer being able to access public benefits and et cetera. So in a lot of ways, um, an individual's full participation in society is forever limited once they have um, a criminal conviction and, and are um, serve an incarceration sentence. So I would argue that 
a combination of retribution and incapacitation are the real purposes of um, our prison system. Okay, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on these graphs because I'm sure you've all seen them many times before, but I do want to just show this just to emphasize that our current mass incarceration numbers are very, very, very new. They're very new. It's just in the last 30 years. The numbers were much lower and very consistent until the late 1970s when those numbers just completely shot up and now we're up to 2.5 million people who are under some form of correction control. So it hasn't always been like this. It's not inevitable. It's not the natural order of things. There was a real shift that took place. Um, and how many people, where are most of the people who are locked up? I just wanted to emphasize that most people are locked up in state prisons and local jails. It's a very small percentage of the population that's in federal custody. So when we hear about things like the federal legislation, the First Step Act, um, it, it impacts a very, very small fraction of the people who are incarcerated. And that doesn't mean that it's not important because it can set norms and it can set a tone for states to decide whether they want to follow or not but the majority of the work is being done on a state and local level, and that's where the funding is also happening. And um, again, this is just a chart that shows how out of step the United States is globally in terms of our incarceration rates, that there's really no comparison um, worldwide either today or historically for the extent to which we use incarceration. And then again, um, most of the money is being spent on the state level, and um, in the last 30 years, you can see that it went from $6.7 billion to $56.9 billion. So it's hugely, hugely expensive. Um, there are a lot of studies that show the way that prison spending, incarceration spending, has really outgrown and outstripped education spending, health spending, um, and it's not cheap, it's something that's really costly. And then I'm sure um, you, you all are aware of Michelle Alexander's new Jim Crow, more than 60% of people in prison are people of color. Um, and the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment for US residents born in 2001 is extremely racialized, so it's one in three for black men, one in six for Latino men, one in 18 for black women, one in 45 for Latino women, one in 17 for white men, and one in 111 for white women. Um, and if you've read The New Jim Crow, you know that Michelle Alexander lays out the case for incarceration essentially operating as a racial caste system, as a racial control and oppression system that is an outgrowth of first slavery and then the Jim Crow system. And when looking at the numbers and when looking at who's impacted and who's not, um, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to come to a different conclusion. Okay, so what is actually going on in prisons? What's one thing um, that continues to be extremely common is sexual abuse in prison. So these are the official statistics from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which estimates that 200,000 prisoners are sexually abused annually. And because it's the official estimate, um, it's likely an underestimate, but this is the official number. It's a huge number of people. And I think, you know, in the last two years since the Me Too movement, I think people have really started to reconceptualize how we talk about and how we joke about sexual harassment, sexual abuse, um, and rape. But one area that I think it's still really common for people to make jokes about, and um, there's still this expectation that if you go to prison, you're going to be raped, is prison rape. Um, and I think that's something for us to really ponder and ask ourselves, why is it that we've internalized and normalized this association between prison and rape? And why is it that in our popular culture, it's still something that it's okay, people feel like it's okay to joke about? And then I just wanted to go through some headlines that I found. I just did a quick Google search of what, you know, prison news in the last month, and these are some of the things that came up. 
So there was a huge cold front on the East Coast a few weeks ago. It was about two degrees, and there was a jail in Brooklyn that did not have heat for almost two weeks. And the folks who were incarcerated are described as sick and frantic, and it took huge mobilization by the community, protest around the clock for 24 hours before um, officials did anything and turned on the heat. Um, jail and prison suicides are extremely common. Um, they're much more common in jails than in prisons. They're about three times more common in jails. And something to remember is that folks who are in jail most of the time have not yet been convicted of anything. They're waiting to go to court. And a lot of the people who are in jail are there because they can't afford their bail. So for many of the people who are in jail, it's their first time. Um, and uh, one of the one of the re speculated reasons for why jail suicide numbers are higher than prison suicides is that people come and have the first time shock of being in that kind of an institution, being cut off from their families, their jobs, their support systems, and they don't have the same intake procedures in terms of mental health. A lot of times people are coming down from alcohol and drug dependencies and are not getting the proper detox care, and that has led to really, really high levels of jail suicides. And these, again, are just from the last month, I did a quick Google search and all these um, jail suicides came up. This was about a month ago, a story of um, four incarcerated individuals. You can see from the picture, they're all black men um, who were handcuffed to a table. They say it was by one of the corrections officers and then they were attacked repeatedly by another incarcerated individual who you can see in the picture um, who stabbed them repeatedly while they were handcuffed to the table. And then we talked about heat. Um, the other side of it is um, not having access to cool air in uh, hot temperatures. So this is from a federal lawsuit in Texas where a federal judge said rising temperatures can kill Texas prisoners and corrections ignored that. And these are in hot, sweltering summer days where the temperatures have been described as boiling. Um, and in this particular lawsuit, the corrections department spent I think it was five times more money litigating the case than it would have cost for them to install an air conditioning system in the facility. So again, think about what, what are the values that undergird that kind of a decision. And then this is from Arizona. Um, where we are now, this was on February 8th, Arizona prisoner dies weeks after warning, I am being killed due to medical neglect. And there have been a lot of um, big class action lawsuits uh, alleging inadequate medical care and access to medical care in Arizona and across the entire country. And I just want to emphasize that this is a very, very small snapshot of the kinds of stories that come out every single week, every single day, um, from the kinds of stories that I hear from the people that I care about and I love, like Gabriel, like Tyra, like all the folks that I work with at Homeboy Industries in terms of um, what they have to endure when they're incarcerated. Um, okay, so really the point of going through all of those um, pretty you know, difficult to think about realities and violence that exists in these structures is to think about back to that question that I posed at the beginning, which is who is safe, who's being kept safe by these facilities and who is harmed and how can we work to address harm without creating more of it? Well, those are really the central questions when I think about why um, I believe in prison abolition and why I think transformative justice is um, one tool to get to that place is I am really trying to center safety. And I want to work towards a world where we can all help each other be more safe without creating more harm. And I don't think that prisons are achieving that specific goal at all. So that's where I want to now offer a formal definition of prison abolition. And this is from a group called Critical Resistance, which has been organizing and teaching and leading, thinking the way um, towards 
prison abolition for the last over 20 years, and it's um, comprised of a lot of people who have been directly impacted by the incarceration system. So they define prison industrial complex abolition as a political vision with the goal of eliminating imprisonment, policing, and surveillance, and creating lasting alternatives to punishment and imprisonment. Abolition is not just about getting rid of buildings full of cages. It's also about undoing the society we live in because the prison industrial complex both feeds on and maintains oppression and inequalities through punishment, violence, and controls millions of people. Because the prison industrial complex is not an isolated system, abolition is a broad strategy. An abolitionist vision means that we must build models today that can represent how we want to live in the future. It means developing practical strategies for taking small steps that move us toward making our dreams real and that lead us all to believe that things really could be different. It means living this vision in our daily lives. Abolition is both a practical organizing tool and a long-term goal. So uh, Ruthie Gilmore, who is an amazing activist, scholar, thinker, who wrote this book called Golden Gulag that goes through the rise of um, incarceration in prisons in California since the 1970s, has this quote that is, um, has been really influential to me, which is that abolition is about presence, not absence. It's about building life-affirming institutions. So what are some of the things that prison abolitionists work on? Because I think when people hear the concept, it sounds so big, it sounds so impossible, like shutting down every prison in the country just sounds like um, such an insurmountable goal. But some of the things that abolitionists have worked on um, in the last couple decades are to end solitary confinement and the death penalty, to stop the construction of new prisons. In Los Angeles, where I live, last week we had a huge victory and there had been a 10-year plan to build a women's jail. It had been seen as inevitable. Everyone had signed off on it. Construction grants were given and the Board of Supervisors, which is our oversight body in Los Angeles, County killed that project after 10 years of activism from the community and of um, providing research and data that shows it would have been built on a toxic site that it, we don't need more incarceration facilities, we need more treatment facilities, we need more care facilities. And the slogan of that campaign was care not cages. Um, and then the big, they were also planning on building a new big men's central jail and the Board of Supervisors decided to build a hospital that would be run by the Department of Mental Health instead of um, the Sheriff's Department. So we still have a lot of work to hold them accountable to how they run that hospital, but it was abolitionists who were at the forefront of that fight. There was people who believed that we should end prisons. These are the kinds of practical decarceration steps that we can take to get to a world where we're not relying on prisons in the same way, is to do that narrative shifting, frame shifting work of having the people who run our county think about public health instead of um, incarceration. Um, they've opposed, prison abolitionists have opposed the expansion of punishment through hate crime laws and surveillance. So um, that has been the kind of the knee jerk reaction by people on both sides, by both conservatives and liberals to things like hate crimes is to, okay, let's criminalize it. Let's create more laws that um, will punish people who commit things like hate crimes. But what happens is when those laws are on the books, the people who end up getting ensnared are almost always people who are already on the margins. And so it ends up just um, increasing the state's net of who is punished and who is incarcerated. Um, so abolitionists try to think of different ways of dealing with harm instead of just writing a law and um, trying to criminalize it. Uh, and then they push for universal health care because that's very, the universal health care housing, those are things that are tied into right now, um, Unfortunately, prisons are some of the only places that a lot of people can, even though there's inadequate health care in a lot of places, for a lot of people it's the only place that they can have any kind of access to health care because we don't have any kind of um, access to health care unless it's an emergency situation on the outside. That doesn't make sense. So working, having um, goals that are broader than just within the criminal legal system is a really important part of an abolitionist strategy. To cr it, it's all about care. It's about creating a society where we're taking care of each other. Okay. Um, 
So I just wanted to ask if anyone knows who these people are. You don't have to give names, just like, what do they have in common? <laughs> yes, these are all abolitionists. So all of these people in the 1800s believed that it was possible to abolish the institution of slavery, even though the institution of slavery was the fundamental economic, political, and social organizing system of the United States of America that had global implications and um, was seen by many as being the natural order of things. Um, many bent over backwards to defend it religiously and thought that it was God's will. In a time when it was really seen as inevitable, these people believed in their hearts that it was immoral, and they made the moral case against slavery. And in the end, they were able to shift enough hearts and minds, they were able to shift the narrative enough that we all know slavery as it existed then no longer exists. Um, so when I think about feeling overwhelmed, and the ab prison abolitionists took, the, took on the mantle of abolition, explicitly from those who were abolitionists against slavery in the 1800s. So when I think about feeling hopeless or feeling like it's too big or feeling like it's impossible, I think that's a real disservice and dishonor to the legacy of these folks who um, really believed and imagined that another world was possible and did it. And I think about Nelson Mandela who says, well, it's only impossible till it's not. Um, and I think they really lived that out, and um, it's important for us to honor their legacy. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is I, I agree with Nala that I think we're at a tipping point today, and I think it's really important for us to not recreate what happened the last time we were at a tipping point, which was in the 1970s. And this is a picture um, from the Attica Rebellion. So in the 70s, there were, and, and you know, in 1980, as I mentioned, the uprising at the Penitentiary of New Mexico, but in the 70s, there were a few huge, large, uh, mass-scale uprisings that occurred at different prisons. This, the most well-known one is Attica. And um, public opinion was really shifting away from prisons. A lot of people were recognizing that it's not working. Um, there was a Republican congressman from Connecticut who decided to spend 36 hours in a prison to see how it was, and when he came out, he emerged from prison an emotionally strained man. He concluded that the current prison system is a big waste of money and human life, and told reporters, I cannot see consigning any human being to this kind of existence. And there was a consensus among all of the national um, well-known own kind of center of the road criminal justice associations that there should be a moratorium on prison construction. There is overwhelming evidence that these institutions create crime rather than prevent it. This is from a 1973 report from the National Advisory Commission on Criminal Justice. So what happened? What happened with that consensus? What happened was that what folks decided to do instead of trying to end the institutions, instead of implementing the moratorium, was reforming the facilities and trying to make them better. And now we're where we are now. Um, and there are a lot of other social, economic, political factors that, you know, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on crime that led to um, the rise in incarceration. But there was a real moment where there was the moral and political will to try to end our reliance on this institution, and we instead went down a reformist path. Okay, so I want to transition now to talking about transformative justice as a, because I don't want to just lay out the problem, I want to offer a, a framework that can be a solution in terms of how to think about how can we get to abolition, like how can we actually implement an abolitionist framework, and that's transformative justice. So um, a quote that helps me enter that space of transformative justice is by Danielle Sered, who runs a restorative justice program in New York, and she says, nobody enters violence for the first time by committing it. So that's something I want us to hold in the back of our heads too, along with like our ideas of safety and what we need of it, and thinking about how should we deal with harm? What's a way to deal with harm that doesn't create more harm and that acknowledges the broader structural and social contexts that lead to people causing harm to each other and to themselves and to ourselves? 
So what is transformative justice? This is a definition I really like by Mia Mingus, who is part of a group called the Bay Area Transform Transformative Justice Collective, and they specialize particularly on ending child sexual abuse. And um, a lot of them are survivors of child sexual abuse who feel that they have been let down by the system, the criminal legal system. And so um, they've been working for years on coming up with transformative justice responses to child sexual abuse and harm. So transformative justice, or TJ, is a political framework and approach for responding to violence, harm, and abuse. At its most basic, it seeks to respond to violence without creating more violence and or engaging in harm reduction to lessen the violence. TJ can be thought of as a way of making things right, getting in right relation, or creating justice together. So what are some of the values that undergird that framework? One, transformative justice does not rely on the state, though some TJ responses may rely on or incorporate social services like counseling. And two, they do not reinforce or perpetuate violence such as oppressive norms or vigilantism. And most importantly, three, they actively cultivate the things we know prevent violence, such as healing, accountability, resilience, and safety for all involved. So one of the central questions when thinking about um, transformative justice is what kinds of community infrastructure can we create to support more safety, transparency, sustainability, care, and connection? So for example, a network of community safety houses that those in danger can use, or an abundance of community members who are skilled at leading interventions to violence. And these things might feel really small, but there are ways for us to divest from the incarceration system, because I think we've all internalized the way that the system um, thinks about how to solve harm. So even things like call out culture or disposability culture, as soon as someone says something we don't like, we write them off and we're like, they're canceled. All of that, I, to me, is um, an internalization of our incarceration state and of our punishment system. So how can we find different ways of responding to harm and engaging with each other? And I think the more that we build out those ways internally within ourselves and in relationship to each other, the more we'll move towards a world where we're not relying on the incarceration system as much. And not only are we not relying it, but we have something else to offer. Because we don't want to be in a place, like Ruthie Gilmore was saying, where We've, just, we've maybe dismantled it, or maybe incarceration rates for whatever reason are going to completely drop, but what do we have to offer in its place? How are we actually gonna deal with harm? How are we actually going to feel safe with each other? So what are the skills we need to be able to prevent, respond to, heal from, and take accountability for harmful, violent, and abusive behavior? So usually when harm occurs, there are three questions that are asked, right? So people ask, okay, what crime was committed? Who committed the crime? And then the third question is usually, okay, how are they going to pay for it? How are we going to punish them? Does that sound familiar from when, some, when a harm occurs? Transformative justice asks a different set of questions. Instead of asking what crime was committed, it asks what do the survivors and the people who have caused the harm need? to be able to move forward from this harm that was committed? What do they actually need? In our current system, people who are harmed have very little voice in, um, in the process. The prosecutors are, um, you know, say that they represent quote unquote the people, but that does not mean that the people who are harmed actually have a say in the decisions that are made. Maybe they'll be called in as a witness, maybe they'll be called in to testify, maybe sometimes, um, a lot of times that doesn't even happen, but transformative justice is really trying to give agency to those who were harmed and also to the person who harmed to be like, what do you need to make Make sure that this doesn't happen again. Why did this happen and how can we make sure you won't cause harm again? And then the second question is um, a more structural question, which is why do survivors and people who have caused harm have so few options in the community? And then the third question is 
what are some of the harmful ways that we treat each other that help set the stage for violence and abuse? And how can we change this? So the difference between, you might be familiar with restorative justice, and I've done a lot of restorative justice work, and I really believe in it. The difference between restorative justice and transformative justice is restorative justice is really more about the individual level, about repairing the harm that occurred between the person who caused the harm and the person who was harmed, whereas transformative justice kind of adds a more structural layer to it. And, um, um, our, you know, the belief is that we can't really repair the individual harm unless we're talking about the bigger systems that facilitated it as well, and what we can do as a community to prevent something like this from happening again. Okay, so um, the last thing I wanted us to do together is a concrete small example of transformative justice in practice. So you have these worksheets on your tables, and this exercise is called pod mapping, and it was put together by the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. And um, they came up with this exercise because they found that in a lot of talk and in a lot of what I talked about, I talk a lot about the, the community. And community can feel like a really abstract, kind of um, amorphous, concept. So instead of talking about the community in this abstract way, we want to talk about who your pod is, okay? And this is for very specific situations. So on one side, it will be who is your pod when you have been harmed. And then on the other side, it would be who is your pod when you have caused harm. So when you know or think that you might have caused harm to someone else. Um, so what does that mean, your pod? Your pod are the people that you feel like you can reach out to and count on in those instances of when you caused harm or when you were harmed to help hold you accountable, to help get you the resources you need, basically to help you process and move through the harm that occurred. So um, you're going to put yourself in the little gray circle in the middle, so you'll put your name there. And then the circle surrounding it, the dark circles, are going to be the people in your pod. So your pod is not necessarily the people you're closest to. Because maybe you're super, super close to your mom or your aunt, but if a certain kind of harm occurred to you, you might not feel comfortable reaching out to them. So it's really about thinking, if you were in a situation when you were harmed, who are the people that you would feel comfortable to reach out to who would help you figure out what the next step is and get what you need um, to move forward. And on the other side, it would be the people that you would reach out to if you think you've caused harm. And those two groups, those two pods, will not necessarily be the same people. They might be, there might be some overlap, or they might be two completely different um, groups of people. So that's something to reflect on once you have the groups. And then the um, circles that are dotted lines, those are people who are movable. So that means you don't quite have them in your pod right now, but maybe with a few conversations, like they're people that you think there could be something there. You think that um, you might want them in your pod, but it's going to take a little bit more building to get them there. And then the big circles all the way around are resources or community groups or institutions that you would want to be able to rely on. So for example, if your grad school cohort or a shelter or um, you know, like your local YMCA, whatever it is that a place that you feel you want to be able to reach out to, to um, get resources from or rely on, A, when you've been harmed, and B, when you have caused harm on the other side. So one, does anyone have any questions about it? Okay, so one thing that comes up a lot in doing this exercise is um, some people don't have any people in their pod, or don't have many people in their pod. And that's really not something to be ashamed of or to feel embarrassed about. I think it's just um, the reality of the systems that we live in that work to isolate us from each other. But it's important data to have to be able to know what are the gaps in your relationships and in your support systems that you want to try to build up so that if 
you're harmed or if you cause harm, you have people that you can reach out to, you don't feel isolated, and you don't feel like your only options are the options that are presented to us um, that you know, rely on punishment and incarceration. Okay, um, and I think it can be helpful once you have your pod to tell the people in your pod that they're in your pod and who the other people are and like kind of have the conversation about what it is that you expect from them, what it is that you need from them. And this is a really good exercise to do um, with younger folks too. So with uh, teenagers and kids to talk about um, harm and safety in a different way. Does anyone have any questions about the exercise? Okay, and um, I don't think I'm gonna have time for a Q&A, but you're welcome to come up to me at any point later today to talk further about anything. But I did want to end with a poem. And first I wanted to end with this adage, hope is a discipline from um, a prison abolitionist and organizer and educator who I really look up to called Mariam Kaba. And her Twitter handle is prison culture. I highly recommend it. I've learned so much from following her. But she always says hope is a discipline. And that's been really helpful to me in moments where I feel overwhelmed and hopeless and um, I buy into these ideas that these structures and systems are too big to change. And uh, that's the idea that hope is really something that needs to be practiced and that I need to put intention and time um, and care into. And the second thing is, the last time you'll have to hear me read something, but is a poem by Victoria Safford that I think goes deeper into this idea of hope that has been really helpful and inspirational to me. Our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which are somewhat narrower, not the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges. People can't hear us there. They can't pass through. Nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything is going to be all right, but a different, sometimes lonely place, the place of truth-telling about your own soul, first of all, and its condition, the place of resistance and defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world, both as it is and as it could be, as it will be, the place from which you glimpse not only struggle, but the joy of the struggle. And we stand there beckoning and calling, telling people what we are seeing, asking people what they see. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share what I see, and I hope that you all will continue to share what you see and that I'll have the opportunity to learn from all of you. So thank you.